So how's everybody doing today? Good. Good. Fantabulous? Yeah. Fantabulous. Yeah. 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 Bobby, you're doing good? Excellent. All right. All right. So we're going to talk about um, global marketing this semester. And we're going to talk about how that's a little bit different from international business. And also many of you have taken, um, in fact, Several of you have also uh, been in my course on um, cultural aspects of international business. And we're going to talk a little bit about the different trade dynamics, legal dynamics, regulatory dynamics, and cultural dynamics. We're going to talk about that a little bit um, throughout the semester. But that's not the focus of the course. But it's important. Um, to ground you that we talk a little bit about that. But um, the way the course is organized is to specifically focus up front on the marketing components of operating in a global economy. <coughs> so first of all, let's just um, start at the beginning, so to speak. Let's talk about marketing. What are the key activities involved in marketing. There's five key components to marketing. Now this is a, a bit of a generalization, but just so that we could get our arms around this. And then we're going to talk about some of the implications in a global setting. But the first activity in marketing, now mind you, each of these activities have like 30 to 50 subcomponents. But just to give you an overview, the first activity is to identify an unmet need. Now we could spend a lot of time talking about how that's done, but we're not going to talk about that right now. So that's the first step, is to identify an unmet need, which is going to involve doing research. And there's two um, types of uh, research that could be done, qualitative and quantitative research. Who could tell me what's the difference? What's the difference between qualitative and quantitative research? Go ahead. So, Daniel, uh, right? Yeah. Quantitative is one you can do it based off of numbers and statistics and boil it down into you know more real figures, whereas qualitative would be more like getting general feels and something like that, say like forming a focus group and seeing what kind of ideas pop up as a result of it. Well, um, you've made um, some good points. First of all, one of the things that Daniel did was give us an example of qualitative research. A good example of qualitative research is a focus group. A focus group consists of 10 to 12 people, and there's a moderator or a facilitator for that discussion, and there's um, a discussion that takes place about a particular product or a particular service, for example, to try and understand what? How we can meet an unmet need or to identify what the unmet need is. So that's the first step is to do qualitative research. A research plan that involves two cities and four sets of focus groups will cost about $50,000. So that's how much it's going to cost to do four sets of focus groups in two cities. So we want to get somewhat of a representative sample where possible. So we don't want to just, unless there's um, a product that we're specifically wanting to sell in New York, for example, we're not going to want to do all our focus groups in New York. So we're going to have to pick um, the cities that are going to be the most representative of our target market. And Daniel told us last time what the definition is for target market. Who remembers? What is the target market and what is the target audience? What's the difference? I recall saying that um, the target market is the people 
that you want buying your product than the target audience is the, the, the people you want the message getting to? Exactly. So the target market is who it is that we want to buy our product or service, and the target <coughs> audience is who we want to reach with our advertising. So do you see the difference? You see why that and very often they're not the same? The target market is everybody that we want to buy our product. It doesn't mean every person, it just means every man, for example. But our target audience, the person that we want to reach with our advertising, or the person that we want to receive our message, might just be Hispanic men. So you see, very often the target audience is a subset <coughs> of the target market. And the reason that's important, and especially with respect to our discussion of global marketing is, because very often we are going to have to customize our advertising campaign. Very often our target audience is going to be a subset of our target market. Especially when we've already determined that we want to sell our product or service in many markets around the world. Because we said that the U.S. is only 5% of the world population. So why is the U.S. so strategic to many companies? Why is the U.S. market so strategic? Why is that significant? Why would so many companies spend so much time, money, and effort to try and sell their product in the United States if that's only 5% of the world's population? 5%! Do you, is, am I making this up? 5% or do you think it's more? Is it 50%? Because it's really, it's only 5%. There's approximately 6 billion people in the world and approximately 300 million of them live in the United States. Now, unless I did my calculations wrong, that's only 5%. So why do we always talk about getting um, distribution in the United States? What do you think? Why is that so important? How wealthy the United States is compared to other countries? We control the majority of the world's wealth? So absolutely. So the per capita income is much higher in the United States than it is in other markets. So if you're going to sell flat panel, 1080pi, high definition, flat panel plasma monitors, see that's something you have to rehearse before class, right? Anybody know what it is I just said? Do you, you guys know what that is? Good, good. <laughs> then you have to find markets where the people have enough purchasing power, where they have enough disposable income, where they could afford to buy those high definition flat panel monitors. Which the price, I can tell you, has come down quite a bit over the last five years. Which is an illustration of what type of pricing strategy. Why is it that, really, <coughs> Maybe seven years ago, flat panel monitors, they didn't have high definition available um, in the US at that time, but why were those flat panel 42 inch um, monitors that were selling for literally $10,000 selling now for, let's say around $1,500 to $2,000? Well, it also now it costs less to make something. Ah, well, this is interesting. Well, well, tell us why why that is. Well, some of it has to do with the technology used now than it did 10 years ago, but also the cost of labor. Because most of these companies do it, for example, in like China, where they, pay, they don't pay their workers anything. So <coughs> the cost of making the TV is a lot less expensive than it was 10 years ago. All right. Well, let's, let's come back to that for then. There's something more we need to talk about that. But first, let's identify the pricing strategy that allowed us to go from $10,000 for a flat panel monitor to approximately, nowadays it's very common, um, to get a good flat panel monitor, large screen, for about $1,500 to $2,000. They even have some that are less than $1,000 now. So why is that? 
because there's a higher demand, and when there's a higher demand, it will reach a lower equilibrium price. Interesting. So we're going to talk about those factors that are controllable and those factors that are not controllable. But we need to ask ourselves, is it really an invisible hand that's at work there? Or is it something that us as business and marketing executives can control? So the marketing mix, remember the marketing mix, the marketing mix is the four P's. One of the marketing mix elements is price. That's something that business executives can determine. Price, product, place, and promotion. That's the marketing mix. But tell me, what is the pricing strategy? Well, at the time, it was probably prestige pricing because it was it was something that was, you know, it was something new. It was it was something that was high line, and you know they had to put it at you know somewhere where it was, you know, it was the new, it was the cool thing to have. Um, and we're going to talk about how that relates to this model. Sometimes it's also referred to as the adoption curve model. I was also going to suggest that uh, I forgot what the what what, it, what it's actually called, but um, there's also a pricing strategy where you'll start out uh, extra high, and then as time goes on, you'll say, okay, we might need to lower it because of demand or because of popularity and things. Like yes. Yeah, so who could tell us what that is? Who said that? You. Yes. <coughs> what is your name? Noah. Noah. Noah Lasco. Yeah. All right. So skimming. So there's a, a component of prestige pricing, and there's um, certainly very clear evidence of a skimming pricing strategy, which is basically what you described. We start at a high price, and then in a very deliberate and planned way, the company lowers the price over time. So it's not a knee-jerk reaction to what's happening in the economy, or what competitors are doing. If you have a skimming strategy, which is very popular in um, the technology sector, <coughs> because of this newness factor like you mentioned, so new technology is introduced at a high price, and then you achieve a certain level of penetration in the marketplace, and then how do we get people to adopt? How do we get more people to purchase a product? Well, in elastic markets, we have to lower the price. So an elastic market is a price-sensitive market. Not all markets are price-sensitive. So in a price-sensitive market, if you lower the price, demand is going to increase. That's what Yanif is talking about. In some markets, you can lower the price, and demand won't increase. It's inelastic. It's not price sensitive. Like what, for example? What would be a good example? What do you think? Uh, uh, like utilities, like water or electricity. Yeah, so what do you think about that? If you lower the price of water or electricity, generally, you're not going to um, start taking more showers because the price per gallon of water at your home has gone down. It doesn't mean that there can't be any change in demand. There might be some change. But when we talk about um, a market being elastic versus inelastic, we want to see um, a significant change. We're expecting to see a significant change if the market is truly elastic. Just like when we talk about the growth rate of a category. If a category grows 2%, 3% per year, you could say that's mature. Basically, um, a category that's mature is it's experiencing no or little growth. So 2% is not what we mean when we talk about growth. When we're talking about growth in a category, we're talking about something that's meaningful. 20, 30, 40, 50%, and in some cases more. All right, so we talked about skimming as a pricing strategy. 
the skilling strategy com uh, depends on the competition or, or just like the, the random the company decides to use a strategy? Um, it's part of their strategic plan. So as part of the marketing plan of the organization, they're going to determine that they're going to introduce the product on January 1st at $800. And then on June 1st, they're going to introduce the, reintroduce the product um, for $100 less. And then three months after that, they're going to reduce the price 10%. And six months after that, they're going to reduce the price 10% again. So all of that is planned. If you're truly following a skimming pricing strategy, that's something that the company has um, mapped out for several years in advance. But I want to come back to, to, to your point about <coughs> the, um, the cost. Because what's going to happen as we move through this adoption curve model, as we move through this adoption curve model, is we're going to achieve economies of scale. I think that's what you were alluding to, is that as we produce a greater number of units, in most production environments, the cost per unit is going to decline. So after a year or two years or three years, four years, we would expect to see a reduction in the cost per unit as we achieve efficiencies. Possibly we're getting component parts for um, a smaller amount. That's going to enable us to follow through on our skimming strategy. So it's not, um, it's not that we just lower the price. We'd like to think that we're still going to be profitable when we lower the price. And we need to go through that analysis to understand, well, what happens if we lower the price 10%? Are total revenues going to increase as a result? And is it going to increase by an amount greater than the decrease in price? So, all of that because you wanted to talk about focus groups, right? Quantitative research. Then there's quantitative research. So right now we're still talking about identifying the unmet need. Just a little bit of an overview. Quantitative research. Quantitative research, a good example would be a survey. Survey through the mail, telephone, internet, all of those are examples of surveys. Mall intercept. Now the difference, um, as you pointed out, is that with focus groups, basically we have 10 or 12 people in the room, and we have some key takeaways that are very insightful, that are very meaningful to us. But the difference is that with qualitative research, we can't say 87% said that <coughs> blue is their favorite color. Because we only spoke to, what, let's say about 48 people. So about four dozen people. Now the fact that we've identified some of the favorite colors is very helpful because what we do is we do qualitative research first and that is the basis for our quantitative research. Because when we do the quantitative research, we're going to focus on testing the colors, for example, or the product attributes that came out of the qualitative research. Because otherwise, how would we know what to ask on the survey unless we had qualitative research done beforehand? And that research could either be primary research or secondary research. Re primary research is research that we conduct. Secondary research is research that somebody else has conducted. Not necessarily and, for this. Right. Absolutely. So it could be um, a research report prepared by a consultant that maybe we bought online. That's very common. 
can find a lot of uh, market research reports online. Um, some of them are actually only about um, $1,500. Some are uh, more expensive than that. But remember, $1,500, although it might sound like a lot, even $5,000 might sound like a lot. But remember, to do the four focus groups, it costs us $50,000. Now, some companies might be willing to do it for, <laughs> for less. I'm just giving you uh, an insight into um, the typical cost for a company to do focus group research. Because um, you have to hire a facilitator, you have to rent the space. So there's an entire industry built around market research. And what makes these facilities unique when we're doing focus groups is that um, there's a mirror behind the facilitator where the client and other members of the research team, whether it be the product manager or the marketing director, where they sit and could observe what's going on during the focus group. And, um, the focus group is videotaped, but still um, people from the brand management team and the product development team usually attend those focus groups because they want to hear for themselves. And importantly, it's not what I think is a great idea or what Daniel thinks is a great idea, but what the customer <coughs> says is a good idea. So it's what our target market says they are willing to purchase. It doesn't matter if I like it or you like it, it's the fact that the target market says that they like it and the product is useful to them and that they, importantly, they would buy it. So we have to, when we do research, we need to probe and understand purchase intent, which is really critical because that's ultimately an indicator of our success. So customers vote with their dollar. If they purchase the product and we generate millions of dollars in sales, then we have to determine whether or not we've reached the hurdle for profitability in our organization. So it doesn't matter if people in the sales organization laugh at you. I've had people um, laugh at me because they thought the idea was ridiculous until Walmart placed a $10 million order. Then they stopped laughing. So remember, it's about what customers think of the product or service and their willingness to buy the product or service. So let's just quickly recap, because right now we just talked about one marketing activity, identifying the unmet need which we said the way that we do that is through market research. We said that there's qualitative research that can be done and quantitative research. We do the qualitative research first and from that we gather the information needed to design our survey instrument, to design our questionnaire, which is an example of quantitative research. And when we do um, quantitative research, then we have something that's statistically significant. So if we have 48 people, and I say 25% said they would buy a wireless phone that takes pictures, but what are we gonna do, what are we gonna do with that? That's something that we could test in quantitative research, but what do I do? What, what do I go back and tell the vice president of marketing? Twelve people said they would buy it? So we need to do quantitative research. Now quantitative research, we need to get a representative sample, and in order to have something that's statistically significant, we should try in most markets, so in general, in the United States, 1,500 in most categories, 1,500 respondents 
is considered to be statistically significant. If it's a representative random sample. So out of 300 million people, we don't need to ask everybody. If we ask everybody, what is that? It's a census. That's a census. Well, who, only the government could afford to do that. We can't ask, right? You can ask 300 million people to find out if they would buy this laptop. No, we need to have a representative sample. So we're going to ask men and women, different ages, different ethnicities, different religions. Go ahead, you Jason. Also, you can also do test marketing. Where you yes. Can, you, you, you know, just launch it in one place and see how it fares there. Yeah, a test market is a, is um, could be a very compelling. <laughs> <laughs> So we were talking about quantitative research, and Daniel raised a question. He said, well, how do we get 1,500? So 1,500, what I'm sharing with you in my experience, is a good rule of thumb to get something that's statistically significant. Now, 1,500, to get 1,500 respondents, um, for example, is part of uh, wall intercept research. Who knows what? What do we mean when we talk about mall intercept? Go ahead, tell us, Daniel. Yeah, so it's basically uh, surveyors who wait in the mall and then intercept people as they go through to ask them a couple of questions. Right. So um, what we need to do, though, to get a representative sample is to be in numerous locations. Let's say, so for example, in the United States, we need to be in numerous malls, different cities throughout the country to be able to get something um, that's representative. Now, I mentioned that a few times. What does that mean? What does that mean to have a representative sample? Because remember, we said we're not doing a census. We're doing a sample, which means that we're going to get feedback from a relatively small percentage of our target market. So importantly, when we do the research, we're not even trying to get a sample of everybody in the United States. Only, for example, men, or only those people <coughs> that buy flowers, or only those people that buy or eat yogurt. See, so it becomes a little bit challenging. It's not just asking, we have to have some screening questions. So when we approach people, one of the things that we need to find out is, for example, do you eat yogurt? Do you buy yogurt? Um, in some cases, we might want to get some people to respond to find out why they don't buy yogurt. So even though they're, um, they're not a current customer, we still would want to find out why they don't um, eat yogurt. That would be of value to us. But We're going to um, get a sample, and somebody was going to tell us what that means to get a representative sample. I think, well, I, I isn't to get a sample that represents the people you're sampling the people who you'd be targeting with the product? Yes, absolutely. You want to add to that, Daniel? Um, it's basically a, a representative sample is a group of people that you can statistically infer something with like a certain degree of, uh, of reliance upon to the larger population that you're aiming to, to target to at a whole. Right, so everybody got what Daniel said? We have a general population. We're going to get, we're going to sample that population. So in this case, we're going to say that the population is our target market. Those people we want to buy our product or service. Is that reasonable? So we define what the population is. It's not just, oh, we're going to sell the product in, um, in Japan, for example. Or we're going to sell the product in Israel that our population automatically is everybody in the country. No, it's reasonable to say that the population is the target market. And then we're going to sample that population. So we're not going to ask all men, we're not going to ask everybody that buys flowers, we're not going to ask everybody that eats yogurt, just a percentage of those people. So the people that we ask have got to be representative their demographics have got to 
be a match with the demographics of our target market. <coughs> so we want to get the typical, let's say, consumer of yogurt in Israel. But remember, we said we're not going to ask everybody. So we need to ask, when we say representative sample, a proportionate number of men, women, in, and different age groups, different income levels. So to do moral intercept research, if we're going to do 1,500, how much do you think that costs? I heard 50,000. Anything else? 150,000. 150,000 for 500 people. So you're actually you're correct. Um, to sample 1,500 people through a moral intercept research is about $150,000. Just to give you a, a sense of magnitude. Doesn't mean that some market research firm wouldn't do it for $125,000 or 135000 but it's certainly not $5,000. So when we talk about identifying the unmet need, what do we talk about? We're doing four groups of focus groups so far, and quantitative research. We've already spent $200,000. So this is serious, right? We're talking about spending a quarter of a million dollars. And usually, we don't just do four sets of focus groups. We usually do at least three sets of four focus groups because each round, right, each group of four focus groups, we learn something. And then based on that input, if we're testing a particular concept, so before we even have a prototype, what we're going to um, test, right, right now we're talking about identifying an unmet need. The next step is to develop a concept. <coughs> so we're going to have focus groups to identify the unmet need, which could be that what? That your wireless communication device, also known as a cell phone, doesn't have internet access. All right, but could you imagine? You know, when I was your age, we didn't have cell phones. Does that blow your mind? Crazy, crazy time. It blows it. <laughs> this is like, I'm talking about like caveman years, right? This is. Did you have a pet dinosaur? You imagine? <laughs> yeah, I did. I had a pet dinosaur. I mean, isn't that unbelievable? Even myself, I think back like, wow. Like, my iPhone is, is literally um, an appendage. So, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, there was a time when. Um, Cell phones didn't exist, and there was also a time when you couldn't access the internet from your cell phone. So identifying that unmet need is something that we could understand through focus group research and brainstorming, which we could do internal and external. So we could do market research internal to the organization. Very often, it's done external to the organization. So. Um, it's quite common that we'll tap into the input from people that work in the organization. But what we need to be sensitive to is two mentalities. One is the marketing orientation, and the other is the production orientation. The production orientation suggests that a company will try to sell what it could make. So what we try to do is sell what we could make. That suggests that we have a certain production capability and so we're going to try and make people buy that product. Now that's different from the marketing orientation. So let me contrast those for you. The marketing orientation says that we will make what we can sell. So you see the difference? The marketing orientation says, we will make what we can sell. We're going to find out what it is that people want, and we're going to develop the production capability and make that. The production orientation says, well, we know how to make 
let's say, um, what would be a good example? We know how to make um, landline phones. So we're just going to keep making them, and we're going to try and convince people to buy them. Uh, isn't that like a huge gamble? Uh, depending on the industry, of course, but isn't it a huge gamble based on technology and whether or not people are going to buy? Or I agree. I don't recommend the production-oriented um, approach, but try and, try and understand the perspective of how somebody would get there. Why would somebody find themselves in that position? Well, if you have $50 billion tied up in manufacturing capability, that could make, well, like, like you're saying, fax machines or something like that, then you're going to just try and keep making those and try to sell them. But really, the goal of advertising is not to persuade people to buy your product or service. If we've done our research, if we've identified the unmet need, if we develop the product that's going to meet those needs, Really, the goal of advertising is just to make people aware that our product and service now exists. And of course, you want to create brand awareness and a favorable brand attitude, but it's not to try and convince people that you need this product. We know this already. If we did our research, we know what they need. We know what their unmet needs are. Yeah, and Jason? That seems to be true for market orientation. If you're talking about production orientation, you, I mean, the goal just seems to be creating demand. Because you, you don't know that the people want it, but you have the capability to do it. So as an advertiser, your goal is to create demand. Well, at, for a production um, orientation, that's absolutely right. What you're trying to do is create demand for a product, whether or not it's needed or not. Simply, simply because we have the capability. Now, that's different about um, than if we were to say that... Um, Everybody is not um, aware that they need this product per se. Because remember, we're always um, looking ahead of the curve. So it may not even be a lot of people, like for example, with the iPod. What's so impressive about the iPod is that Apple didn't create or invent the MP3 player. That's really impressive. They didn't create that product. What they did was very effectively brand the MP3 player using the iPod um, brand architecture. So what they did is they wrapped the MP3 player in the iPod brand name. And then made people aware of the features and benefits of the product. Um, if what you were saying is true in regards to it, you know, if you're doing marketing right, then only, then, then you're not, you have no need to create a need. I mean, there's an entire. Subject. No, not not. I didn't say not to create a need. Of course, you well, want to well, create you, category you, need, whether it's for milk or orange juice, right, Josh? Um, well, of course you want to create category need, but that's different from saying you're trying to persuade people and even in some cases trying to force them to buy a product that they don't need simply because we have that manufacturing capability. So it's those two elements together. It's not just that you're trying to persuade. I'm not saying that there's not elements of... Um, advertising that's persuasive, right, no, but no, 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 I'm no, saying no, no. from the manufacturer's standpoint that their um, motivation is based on the fact that they have the production capability. Right, but, but there's like an entire subset of advertising of like, you know, uh, you can think of a lot of different products where the advertising itself creates the need, whereas somebody wouldn't normally think that, oh, this is a problem, but until they see the advertisement, then they think like, oh, that is a problem, I do need that product. So I would say that's building awareness of, um, of either the product or the category, right? So I'm not saying that we don't want to, certainly um, <coughs> one of the objectives of advertising can frequently be to create category need. So now you're forcing me to explain the orange juice example. So 
You ready, Josh? Right. Here we go. All right, so this is, the <laughs> this is a good example. Like for, um, as you're mentioning, category need. Are you familiar with the Got Milk campaign? Yes. So the purpose of the Got Milk campaign is about creating category need to make people aware of the benefits of drinking milk. And it doesn't focus on a particular brand. What it does is it focuses on a product type, which is to try and create demand for milk. Not for the XYZ brand of milk or the ABC brand of milk, but for milk as a category is what Daniel is referring to. So often we do have um, advertising that will focus on creating category need, which is also sometimes referred to as primary demand. Now, one of the things that the manufacturers of orange juice realized through their research is why it is that people purchase milk. This was very insightful and something that had a significant impact on their business strategy. They started to um, research to understand who is in their competitive set. They wanted to know who are their direct competitors and who are their indirect competitors and why. So you might think that their direct competitors, let's say for Minute Maid, for Minute Maid Orange Juice, one of their direct competitors is Tropicana. Because if people um, are in a grocery store, they're going to choose between Minute Maid orange juice, Tropicana, what are some other brands of orange Florida juice? Florida's Natural. Simply Florida's orange. Natural. Simply orange. Simply orange. But they didn't just stop there. They wanted to find out who were their indirect competitors and who maybe are indirect competitors, but can be classified as direct competitors. So they wanted to find out why people drink milk. And they found out that people um, drink milk because they want calcium, um, vitamin D, for example. And so what did that cause the orange juice companies to do is to start promoting the fact that orange juice is high in um, potassium, high in vitamin C, contains calcium, contains vitamin A, vitamin D. And they realized that in some cases, milk, was a substitute for orange juice. Or, depending on whose perspective, you could say that orange juice is a substitute for milk. So, the Got Milk campaign, which is um, somewhat unusual, why? Because competitors are working together. Because they're saying, you know what? This dairy farmer, is, he's not really my competitor. And this dairy farmer is really not my competitor, maybe at some level, but why don't we all put our resources together and promote, as Daniel was suggesting, the category to get people to drink more milk overall? Because you know who our competitor is? Not ABC Dairy Company or XYZ Dairy Company, but the competitors for milk is orange juice. So this is something that they learned through their research, which is very compelling. <coughs> because they understood the motivation for purchasing the product. So it's not just enough to understand that people purchase your product, but why? Why do they purchase your product, or why do they not purchase your product, is important. 
Questions? We, we, we spoke about the first uh, identifying, you know, unmet needs. Are we going to get to the, yes. the other four? Yes. So I told you there could be 30 or 50 components, and we just looked at some for un identifying an unmet need. Just to view, make sure you have this on your notes. Quantitative research, qualitative research. Primary research, secondary research. We talked about um, direct competitors and indirect competitors. From there, the next step is to develop a concept, determine a price that customers are willing to pay, Create awareness, so create awareness <coughs> for our brand, and then, and the order matters in this case, and then gain distribution. So we're going to identify an unmet need. Develop a concept, and that's why when we develop the concept, why we're going to do so many rounds of uh, qualitative research. Because first we have, um, we're soliciting um, input from the target market, then we're going to develop that into a concept, and then um, we're going to take those concepts or concept boards to research, and then based on that, we're going to develop prototypes, so prototypes can be very expensive. So you want to um, take concept boards to research first. Then once you get enough input and you could fine tune those concepts, then you could develop um, prototypes. Then we're going to determine a price that the customer is willing to pay. And then, I think I did um, misspeak, the next step four would be to gain distribution and then build awareness. So I fell into the trap that I wanted to call to your attention, which is before you start advertising, you need to make sure that your product is available. So the fourth step is to gain distribution and then start to build awareness. Because what we don't want to happen, except in rare situations and in some unique categories what we don't want to happen is to spend a lot of money on advertising and then have people let's say go into the store like Walmart or Target or Best Buy and find that the product isn't on the shelf uh, well, Apple does that all the time. yes they do so there's a question we have to ask ourselves do they do that on purpose yeah. or uh, do they have trouble forecasting because forecasting demand is very difficult to do. To properly and accurately forecast demand is very challenging. If you could do that with a high level of precision, you should see me after class. All right, because $100 billion companies struggle um, doing that, and they have dozens of people working as part of a team to try and anticipate and forecast demand. It's something that's very difficult to do. Sometimes companies guess wrong, and that's why they have a shortage. Now, in some categories, there's a belief that they're creating built-up demand, that they're creating this pent-up demand when they're creating some level of hype for a particular product. Now, if the product is a high-involvement product, you could play that game because um, people will... Um, continue to go back to the store and look for, let's say, a new release of um, a DVD or a new release of a video game. But that's for a high involvement product. Do you think those are high involvement? Something that people um, will spend a lot of time um, researching? Cars. Well, cars would also be um, a good example. Usually products that are 
um, expensive or considered to be high involvement, but what's expensive to some is not expensive to others, but certainly um, cars could be considered um, high involvement. What do you think, why Josh? Are, why are video games considered high involvement? I thought high involvement really is like you spend, like you read the details about it and you look at <coughs> a lot of research on that product. Yeah, you don't think that um, gaming in general is sort of, um, I, guess I hate to use the word like cult-like, I don't know, maybe it's like, I mean that phenomenon of like uh, this sort of uh, category of, I mean gamers in general, there's um, a very high level of involvement in purchasing the product, but it's something, a product that once you purchase, that you use and you're intimately involved in. I'm not a gamer. Um, I have a PlayStation. I think it's probably the original one. But um, what, what do you guys think? Do you think like gaming, like that's a phenomenon that people are very involved in? Or do you think? You, you think so? Oh, yeah. Right? That's kind of a. Uh, whereas, like, um, buying uh, soda. Oh, well, you get people, sometimes people feel very strongly about Coke versus Pepsi, but if they don't have the product, um, depending on the level of brand loyalty, very often people will buy a different brand, well maybe they'll buy orange juice instead, right, but um, I wouldn't think that um, milk or orange juice is a high involvement product, but gaming, that's quite a, um, a phenomenon in our, um, in our culture today. Also, um, yeah, I think that's a good example of a, a cultural phenomenon. But other um, other products, not so much. Even um, uh, music, there is definitely um, a group of people that feel this affinity to a particular um, musician or singer. If you go into the store and they don't have the product, they don't have it, you know, it's supposed to drop on January um, 15th, and it's not in the store. Well, if that's one of your favorite singers, then you're going to go back again. And they're counting on that. So they take advantage of that. They're from a consumer behavior standpoint, they understand that. So I agree that in some category, it does create a level of hype. Right, a level of anticipation. You went to the store, they didn't have the product. So what does it do? Make it less desirable or more desirable? Right? In many cases, it makes it more desirable. Now you want it even more. But not in all categories, though. So that's the thing is we have to, as executives, we have to know how to apply um, these concepts and understand when they're relevant and not relevant. But in terms of adoption, let's, um, let's get to this before we go and talk about what's called the diffusion of innovation sometimes referred to as the adoption curve model. This model suggests that adoption occurs at different rates. Now, there's certain percentages associated with the model. It's conceptual. For us, the key takeaway is, is that it's relevant and it's applicable. Doesn't mean exactly to that percentage, but the idea is that there's a certain group of people that will purchase a product when it first comes out. And then our challenge is to modify the marketing mix to get the next group, the next segment, to adopt the product. And that's why um, this is very relevant to what we talked about in terms of the skimming pricing strategy, which is you introduce the product at a high price. So that group, the ones that are the first to buy, we call the innovators. Then we have the early adopters.
We have the early majority. And then the non-adopters. This is in um, chapter 12. Yeah. The laggards? Yeah, sometimes the term used is laggards. But I think the more user-friendly term is non-adopters, right? So non-adopters are those people that are not going to purchase um, the product. So we have a certain percentage, about 2.5%, that are going to purchase the product when it first comes out. Those are the people that are going to purchase the iPhone at $600 when it first comes out. So after the first 2.5%, and it could be 3.5%, it could be 5%. The idea is that a small percentage of the target market is going to purchase the product at $600. So then after they purchase that, and hopefully we thought about this <laughs> long before, the question is, how do we get the early adopters to purchase? How do we get the next 13.5% to purchase? How do we get the early majority to purchase? How do we get the late majority to purchase? And these, well, basically, you don't really expect that they're going to purchase the product. But one of the things we want to find out in research is why. We should understand why there's non-adopters. Because maybe these non-adopters, we could convert to adopters. We need to understand. Maybe the product is too complex. That's one of the um, challenges of advertising technology products is we have to spend a lot of time communicating how to use the product and its features and benefits. So technology companies, they spend a lot of time and also promote that their product is easy to use. Easy to use. Somebody said, you know, very simple. Um, this kind of plug-and-play approach to design that basically you just um, take, let's say, like a desktop computer out of the box, plug it in, and you could use it. And they've tried very hard to make that a reality. You know, now they color code the, <laughs> the wires. When I got my first computer, the wires weren't color coded. It was tricky to, to, <laughs> to set it up. Now you're like, oh, you take the purple wire, that's the keyboard, and right, it's simple. And that's intentional, because they understand that people figure, when I get home, how am I going to put this thing together? So the companies try to encourage us and convince us that, no, it's simple. Take it out the box, plug it in, and you could use it. So what's one of the ways that we could accelerate the rate of adoption? Because what we're looking at here is, this is time. So this could be one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, etc. And this is, we could say, the number of units or the dollar sales. As we move through time, how can we accelerate the rate of adoption? That's our challenge. We need to understand the key takeaway for us is that there is an adoption curve model. That everybody doesn't go out and buy the product when it's first released. 200 million people just go out and buy the product. What we need to understand is that this model is something that we're responsible for managing. As global marketers, we need to manage the rate of adoption. It's our responsibility. So how are we going to get the early adopters to purchase our product? What's some of our options? Because remember, our biggest weapon, if you will, is the marketing mix. Those are the controllable factors. There's controllable factors and factors that are not controllable. 
like just quickly, an uncontrollable factor would be like the economy. We have no control over it if it's a recession. If there's a recession, bummer, that's, <laughs> that's a problem. We can't control that. But what can we do? Could it reduce the price? Right. In an elastic market, we could lower the price, and our expectation is that the number of units that we're going to sell is going to increase. What else could we do? Well, we can promote it in a different way or even potentially give it a different usage. So absolutely. So promotion is one of the four Ps. And promotion also includes advertising. But advertising does not begin with P, right? So promotion is all-inclusive, including sales promotions, trade promotions, and also advertising. So we could advertise and build awareness, create, as uh, Daniel said, category need for, let's say, MP3 players, but also secondary demand for a particular brand. So when we're advertising for a particular product, we're creating, very often we are creating primary demand. And you say, wow, but doesn't that benefit everybody? Yes. So when Tropicana advertises, they're building awareness and trying to create a favorable brand attitude for the Tropicana brand, but they're also creating demand for orange juice, right? That's, that's unavoidable. So does Minute Maid benefit from that? Yes. Does Simply Orange benefit from that? Yes. Do all the brands in the category benefit from that. What else? Increase the distribution channels? Absolutely. So one of the four P's is place. So you could expand distribution. And not today, but we'll talk about intensive distribution, um, selective distribution, exclusive distribution, which has to do with <clears throat> how much distribution there is of our particular product. What else? What else could we do? Well, you guys really had to mention promotions, which could be um, a contest or a sweepstake or a coupon. Or, um, Daniel alluded to this guy. Is marketing. Yes, absolutely. Which would be what? You're thinking of like a sample or a trial? or? Uh, I mean, I was going to say uh, taking, turning, I mean, I know they do this, uh, turning a subway car into. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so outdoor advertising. Right, absolutely. Yeah, that's what you want to do, um, is to saturate a particular market, to create a strong brand presence. But also, um, we could add features. We could add features to the product. So, like, think back to the iPod. Right, there was no um, LCD screen, right? Wasn't video capability, then they added the LCD screen, but of course it was black and white. Then they added it in color. And so as they added more features and more functionality and more benefits, then we moved through the adoption curve model. So what did we do? We modified the marketing mix and accelerated, ideally, the rate of adoption through this model, right? I'm interested that the different generations of the iPods have their own curve. The different generations have their own curve? Yeah, well, I would look at it in terms of the product life cycle, which is also a, um, a bell-shaped curve. So, I mean, you could look at it that way. What was the rate of adoption for a particular model, for example? So, absolutely, you, you, could, you could do that. Um, generally, uh, you would look at it in terms of the entire category or your entire product line, but certainly the same um, concept is relevant. So we'll continue, um, we'll talk about this a little more next time. All right? Have a good night, do good things. Don't do drugs. Pants, yeah? Yes, yeah. The Pantsky! See you later. Oh, <laughs> <laughs>